lead singer of Iron Maiden. But when I'm not touring, I've got a new day job. Because I get high flying 30 million pounds worth of real heavy metal. Between singing with the band, I've been flying passengers around the world for four years now. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this Boeing 757 Australia's Airlines flight. I'm your first officer. My name is Bruce Dickens. Well, this is what some pilots refer to as the front office. It's a bit different to a desk, and it's a bit different to 50,000 people at a rock festival. But it's the Boeing 757, one of the most overpowered aircraft in the sky, and it really is a spectacular form of employment. <laughs> Right now, I'm going to fly you through the history of the jet airliner. A transatlantic battle for the dominance of the skies. Clear prop! Okay, now, I know this isn't a jet, but 70 years ago, props ruled. The world was littered with aircraft manufacturers, and the Douglas Corporation was at the top of the pile. This, their legendary DC-3, was the ultimate in technology and passenger comfort. Only three years after its launch, it was carrying 90% of airline traffic around the world. The Douglas DC-3 was incredibly versatile. It could carry passengers, it could carry freight, it could carry mail, it could carry troops, paratroops. Almost anything you demanded of this aircraft, it could do. And for that reason, it is still in active airline service. It carried 21 passengers at around 200 miles an hour, but these 1,200 horsepower, 14-cylinder piston props were noisier than an Iron Maiden gig. The ride would shake your fillings loose, and it would take over a week to reach your granny in Australia. I've never flown a plane like this in my life, but Mike, the pilots, got the kahunis to let me have a go. Let's try a little 45 to the left, I suppose. Okay, you're on clear left. You're on a 100 heading, a 180. And a bit of back stick. Lead turn a little bit. And there's 45. Bit of back pressure, bit of over banking there. Well, the controls and instruments are where I'd expect to find them, but the handling's a bit like wrestling a bag of snakes. Roll out. The control wheel is really astoundingly, um, I suppose, uh, uh, large in its uh, compass. Uh, you know, you, 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 can, you can sort of do things like that, and not a lot happens, really, immediately. There's sort of a, uh, yeah, a time delay built in, I think. Yeah, I mean, is, if, yeah. if I did that on my 757, people would be screaming. Yeah. You know. In the 30s, this was state of the art. But by the end of the Second World War, military technology had advanced by quantum leaps. Bombers were flying twice as high, flying twice as fast, and carrying twice as much payload. It was time for the civilian airline fleets to play catch up. And it was a British invention that would thrust aviation into a new era. Way back in 1926, eccentric visionary Frank Whittle first came up with the jet engine. He spent a decade battling skeptics before his jet-propelled Gloucester Pioneer took to the skies in 1938. It was a turning point in history. Old Frank could never have dreamt how the sketch he'd made at 19 would change the lives of pretty much everyone on the planet. The advantage of the jet over the prop was that it was lighter, it had almost limitless potential for developing more power and was much simpler in its essential operation. Effectively, for a jet, Air is sucked in at the front, 
is compressed in this case by very simply being squished against a big flat plate is pushed into a burner can set fire to with kerosene the air and the fuel very very hot now go out via this turbine out the back and what goes out the back is thrust in doing so it turns a turbine which is connected through a common shaft to the compressor right at the front and this whole cycle is therefore started all over again and in fact if you just shovel fuel into it without any control it'll just blow itself up the military loved the jet by the end of the war 2,000 of the things had been built but by then civil aviation in Europe was in tatters but over in America, business was booming. Civilians had been flying airliners throughout the war, and aircraft manufacturers like Douglas saw no reason to change what had been a winning formula. Big piston engines with more and more props. They didn't know it then, but a small island off the coast of Europe was about to catapult them into the jet age. Over in austerity-ridden Britain, came this astounding piece of engineering which stunned the world. The world's first jet airliner, the de Havilland Comet. In 1949, the Comet flew into aviation history. No one had seen anything like this before. It was sleek, it was elegant. The engines were hidden inside the wings. This was the Concorde of its day. The jet engines were free of the bone-shaking vibration of the old pistons and props, and it flew at 40,000 feet, where the thin air made it more fuel efficient. This, the Mark IV, was its largest and most powerful incarnation. Well, here I am in the engine room. Well, actually, I'm in the wing route of the Comet 4 because this is where the designers chose to put the Rolls-Royce Avon engines. The advantages, a clean wing, low drag, aerodynamically very efficient. With four Rolls-Royce turbojets, the Comet would take you pretty much anywhere in half the time. It would take you there above the nastiest of the weather that all the other aeroplanes had to endure. And it would get you there in smooth, quiet, air-conditioned surroundings. Welcome to the jet set. But for the pilots, it must have been like getting into Dan Dare's spaceship. Captain Tony Angus is a man who knows. Well, I think it was natural uh, feeling to have a slight apprehension because it was something very new. But in fact, it was a nice aeroplane to fly. It was an easy aeroplane to fly. It responded very well in all respects. And the only difference with the engines was that when you open the throttles, the power came on a little bit more slowly. Mm. But otherwise, it was a completely conventional aeroplane. And in fact, everybody who flew the Comet said in comparison with other aeroplanes they'd flown, there's very little vibration, very little noise. Uh, we're sitting at a comfortable attitude for the aeroplane to fly in, and it's a sheer pleasure. And it was a pleasure for the passengers too. Well, those who could afford it. It may have shaved eight hours off the flight to Johannesburg, its initial route, but a return ticket in 1952 would set you back £315, around the price of a small house.